This is chapter 8 of The Bolsheviks Come to Power by Alexander Rabinowitch. Uh, the Bolsheviks and Kornilov's Defeat. Petrograd awoke to near perfect weather on Sunday, August 27th, the day designated for celebrating the six month anniversary of the February Revolution. It was reasonably warm and the air was crystal clear. Placards in bold type prominently displayed throughout the city, reminded citizens of the fundraising rallies scheduled that day in the capital's largest meeting and concert halls. The morning papers contained no hint of the open struggle that had erupted between Kornilov and Kerensky. The front page of Izvestia was given over to an appeal for donations for the Soviet's upkeep. The duty of every worker, soldier, and peasant the duty of every responsible citizen in these critical black days is to support the legitimate organ of the all-Russian revolution, admonished the headline. For the second consecutive day, Rabichi ca cautioned workers and soldiers not to respond to provocative appeals for revolutionary action. Sinister people are circulating rumors of a rising set for today and allegedly being organized by our party, the paper warned. The Central Committee implores workers and soldiers not to yield to provocations, to maintain a restraint and calm, and not to take part in any action today. Most of the top Soviet leadership spent Sunday morning circulating through the districts of Petrograd, making speeches at fundraising rallies. Toward midday, garbled rumors of the rift between Kornilov and Kerensky began to circulate through the Smolny Institute, the former exclusive boarding school for daughters of the nobility, which since earlier August had been serving as central headquarters of the Soviet. The gravity of the emergency facing the government did not become apparent to Soviet deputies until mid-afternoon. At that point, leaders of the various parties represented in the Soviet began rounding up their colleagues for emergency fraction meetings. But it was not until 11.30 that evening, more than 24 hours after Kerensky had concluded that Kornilov was intent on overthrowing the government, that the all-Russian executive committees convened in a closed joint plenary session to consider the crisis. With interruptions, the executive committees gathered in the majestic high ceiling assembly hall of Smolny, deliberated through the night and well into the morning of August 28th. Two difficult interrelated problems confronted the deputies. In the first place, in view of the apparent alliance and subsequent conflict between Kerensky and Kornilov, the foundering of the second coalition and Kerensky's intention of establishing a directory the Soviet needed to adopt a position regarding the future of the provisional government. In addition, the deputies were forced to cope with the more immediately pressing task of helping to organize the military defense of the capital. Debate on the government question was heated. A spokesman for the Bolsheviks, Sokolnikov, took the position that the revolutionary democracy could have no confidence in the existing government, implying that it should be removed immediately. The provisional government created conditions for counter-revolution, he asserted. Only the realization of decisive program, a republic, peace, and bread can instill the masses' confidence in the government. Yet, for the time being, the Bolsheviks did not offer a formal resolution on the government question. The moderate socialists, for their part, accepted at face value Kerensky's version of his differences with Kornilov namely that at hand was a carefully planned conspiracy against the revolution and the legitimate government. In these circumstances, they saw no choice but to support the prime minister. Thus, S.L. Weinstein, on behalf of the Mensheviks, declared early in the proceedings, we must acknowledge that the only person who can form a government at this time is Comrade Kerensky. An attack has been made on Kerensky and the provisional government, and if they should fall, the revolutionary cause will be lost. The executive committees at first emphatically rejected an oblique suggestion by the SR representative, 
V. N. Richter, that it might be necessary to go along with Kerensky on the creation of a directory. A majority was obviously more sympathetic to Martov's claim that all directories spawn counter-revolution. The deputies passed resolutions stipulating that the form of government was to remain unchanged and granting Kerensky authority to fill the, vacan fill the vacancies in the cabinet left by the withdrawal of the cadets with democratic elements. At the same time, they agreed to work for the convocation at an early date of yet another state conference, this one to be made up exclusively of representatives of those democratic organizations which had, support, which had supported the Soviet's platform at the Moscow State Conference. It was understood that this conference would reevaluate the government question and also that the provisional government would be responsible to it until the convocation of the Constituent Assembly. Significantly, the Bolsheviks abstained rather than vote against the resolution calling for retention of a coalition under Kerensky, and they actually sided with the Mensheviks and SRs on the question of convening another state conference, requiring only that the assembly be revolutionary, i.e. composed entirely of socialist groups. During a break in the executive committee's deliberations, members of the Presidium made a brief trip to the Winter Palace to inform the government of the preceding decisions. Kerensky, however, was adamant about the immediate creation of an all-powerful six-man directory. Only a government small in number and totally unified in outlook, he contended, would be capable of acting swiftly and decisively enough to deal effectively with the attack from the right. Upon the delegates' return to Smolny, Kerensky's posture triggered a fresh round of acrimonious debate. Speaking for the Bolshevik fraction, Lunikarsky, for one, ignoring the decisions of the 6th Congress, proclaimed that the moment has come for the Soviet to create a national government. He introduced a resolution branding as counter-revolutionary, both the Kornilov movement and the provisional government, and calling for the creation of a government of workers, peasants, and soldiers, interpreted by Lunikarsky's listeners to mean transfer of all power to the Soviets. This government would decree a democratic republic and speed convocation of a constituent assembly. Evidently, this proposal was not put to a vote. As night turned to morning, the existing danger to the revolution was presented to the deputies in ever more alarming terms. Many now learned for the first time of the immediate military threat posed by Krimov's advancing Third Corps, and also the fact that generals on several fronts were openly siding with Kornilov. In this tension-charged atmosphere, wild rumors acquired instant credence. There is fighting in Luga. The rail station at Dino has been blown up. Soldiers loyal to Kornilov are even now disembarking at the Nikolevsky station. Under the pressure of such reports, the bleary-eyed deputies gradually swung to Krinsky's side, ultimately adopting a resolution proposed by Suratelli, pledging full support to the Prime Minister. The resolution left the form of government completely up to him, provided only that he pursued the struggle against Kornilov with vigor. Notably, even the Bolsheviks, while vehemently protesting the granting of such prerogatives to Kerensky, nonetheless announced <coughs> that if the government were genuinely committed to fighting the counter-revolution, they would form a military alliance with it. Addressing themselves to the immediate military threat, officials of the Soviet issued emergency appeals and instructions to key institutions and groups, to army and front committees, provincial Soviets, postal, telegraph, and railroad workers, and soldiers of the Petrograd garrison. According to the Soviet's directives, orders emanating from Stavka were not to be obeyed. The movement <clears throat> the movement of counter-revolutionary forces was to be watched closely and impeded 
Correspondence. I lost my spot. Correspondence and communications between elements hostile to the revolution were to be disrupted. And orders of the Soviet and the provisional government were to be carried out without hesitation. To help organize and direct the struggle against Kornilov's forces, the executive committees created an extraordinarily military defense organ, an extraordinary military defense organ, the Committee for Struggle Against the Counter-Revolution, which began to function on the afternoon of August 28th. As first envisioned, the Committee for Struggle Against the Counter-Revolution was to include, among others, three Menshevik representatives, three SRs, and even three Bolsheviks. The presence of the latter signifying grudging acknowledgement of the stature and growing influence of the Bolsheviks among the masses. But would the Bolsheviks really join actively with the moderate socialists and the government in the fight against Kornilov? As counter-revolutionary forces approached and the capital braced for battle, this was a crucial question in the minds of moderate socialist leaders. The Menshevik internationalist Sukhanov later pointed out the importance of the, of the Bolsheviks at this time. The committee making defense preparations had to mobilize the worker soldier masses, but the masses insofar as they were organized were organized by the Bolsheviks and followed them. At the time, theirs was the only organization that was large, welded together by an elementary discipline and linked with the democratic lowest levels of the capital. Without it, the committee was impotent. Without the Bolsheviks, it could only have passed the time with appeals and idle speeches by orators who had lost their authority. With the Bolsheviks, the committee had at its disposal the full power of the organized workers and soldiers. For the Bolsheviks, mapping a suitable program of action during the Kornilov crisis was no simple matter. Although several top officials jailed in July had already been freed, Kemenev, for instance, Trotsky, who was soon to play a decisive role in the party's fortunes, was still languishing in prison. Lenin and Zinoviev remained underground, the former hiding in Finland, the latter in a Petrograd suburb. Lenin dispatched directives relating to the struggle against Kornilov to his colleagues in Petrograd as quickly as he could, but his instructions written on August 30th did not reach the capital until the first days of September, well after the crisis had passed. To be sure, the party leadership had, as a practical guide, the bitterly debated resolutions on tactics adopted four weeks earlier by the 6th Congress. But as we have seen, these were highly ambiguous. While the Congress's statement on the, pol on the political situation <clears throat> encouraged, hold on, encouraged collaboration with all elements dedicated to fighting counter-revolution. The resolution on unification, which expressly declared that the Mensheviks had deserted to the camp of the enemy of the proletariat for good, seemed to preclude cooperation in any form between Bolsheviks and moderate socialists. <clears throat> Did this mean that the party could not join with the Mensheviks and SRs not to speak of the government, in defense measures against Kornilov, but rather that it would have to strike out on an entirely independent revolutionary course. <clears throat> on the night of August 27th, 27th to 28th, Petrograd Bolshevik leaders had every reason to suppose that Lenin's assessment of the situation would conform to the views expressed in On Unification. Apart from his unequivocal pronouncements of mid-July and his instructions to the 6th Congress of direct relevance were supplementary instructions to the Bolshevik Central Committee and an article, Rumors of a Conspiracy, which Lenin wrote on August 18th to 19th. He had been prompted to prepare these statements after reading in Novaya Zizin of August 17th, a report of collaboration between Bolsheviks and moderate socialists in the Provisional Revolutionary Committee organized by the Moscow Soviet during the Moscow State Conference. From this dispatch, Lenin correctly surmised that to ward off an expected counter-revolutionary military attack, 
Moscow Bolsheviks had allied closely with local Mensheviks and SRs. This news had enraged Lenin. Here was further evidence of the reluctance of many of his most influential associates to break decisively with the Mensheviks and SRs, and to the contrary of their inclination toward working with compromisers in pursuit of common goals. Lenin was apprehensive that such predilections within the party would hamper the prospect of its acting boldly to take power at an opportune moment. Hence, he attacked the Moscow Bolsheviks unmercifully. <clears throat> um, starting from the assumption that the provisional government and the majority socialists were no less hostile to the revolution than Kornilov and his Cossacks, Lenin contended that the counter-revolutionary scare of mid-August had been artfully contrived by the Mensheviks and SRs to hoodwink the masses into believing that they were champions of the revolution. The political scheme of the Menshevik and defensist traitors is as clear as, it, as can be. It is hard to believe that among the Bolsheviks there are fools and scoundrels who would enter into a block with the defensists now. The Congress resolution on unification being what it is, any Bolshevik who came to terms with the defensists would, of course, be expelled immediately and deservedly, <clears throat> and deservedly from the party. Even in the event that a counter-revolutionary attack appeared genuine, not a single honest Bolshevik who had not taken leave of his senses completely would agree to any bloc. In these circumstances, a Bolshevik would say, our workers and soldiers will fight the counter-revolutionary troops. They will do so not to defend the government, but independently to protect the revolution as they pursue their own aims. A Bolshevik would tell the Mensheviks, we shall fight, of course, but we refuse to enter into any political alliance, whatever with you, and reject expression of the least confidence in you. In the instructions appended to rumors of a conspiracy, Lenin requested that the Central Committee launch an official inquiry into the behavior of local Bolshevik leaders during the Moscow State Conference and demanded that any party officials found guilty of participating in a bloc be removed from the Central and Moscow Committees, implying that the popular protest stimulated by the Moscow Conference indicated that an uprising on the order of the July days was not far off and that when this occurred the party would have to take power into its own hands he insisted it is absolutely essential to have people at the helm in moscow who will not serve to the right or who will not swerve to the right who will not form blocks with the mensheviks and who will understand the new tasks of the party and the new slogan of seizing power information on the initial responses of top bolshevik leaders in petrograd to news of Kornilov's attack on the provisional government is fragmentary. It appears that not until August 30th did the Central Committee meet as a body to take account of the latest developments. The Bolshevik fractions in the All-Russian Executive Committees, among whom were several Central Committee members, first met in connection with the, de with the developing crisis on the early evening of August 27th. They probably caucused again after midnight during an extended break in the executive committee's de deliberations. It is well to bear in mind that within the party Soviet fractions, the influence of moderates such as Kemenev was strong throughout the summer of 1917. The right wing of the party had rejected Lenin's radical revolutionary course at the April conference and later with less energy at the sixth Congress. It did so again the night of August 27th to 28th. At the start of the All-Russian Executive Committee's meeting just described, Bolshevik spokesmen did not present a formal resolution on the government question. Subsequently, the party supported the Mensheviks and SRs in calling for another broad national conference to reassess the political situation. After Kerensky's firmness on the matter of establishing a directory became known, Lunikarsky insisted not only that the Soviet break decisively with the government, but that it take upon itself 
the responsibility for forming a new government. His resolution envisioning the declaration of a democratic republic and the immediate convocation of a constituent assembly was fully consistent with a theoretical outlook of the moderates. Worse yet, from the point of view expressed in rumors of a conspiracy, in the heat of the moment, a Bolshevik representative actually had offered a formal alliance with the government in defense of the revolution. At about the time the Bolshevik Soviet fractions first met at Smolny, the Petersburg Committee was an emergency session across the city in the Narva district. Ironically, the meeting had been scheduled three days earlier at the insistence of Bolshevik militants from the Vyborg district disgruntled by what they perceived to be the failure of higher party bodies to respond adequately to the growing threat of counter-revolution. It began with a report on the latest developments by the Central Committee's Andrei Bubnov, a revolutionary activist since his student days in Ivanovo Voznesensk and a veteran of some 13 arrests and five prison terms. The 34-year-old Buvnov was a relatively recent arrival in Petrograd, having moved from Moscow to the capital after his election to the Central Committee at the 6th Congress. In Moscow, Buvnov had been associated with a group of young radicals centered in the party's Moscow Regional Bureau. In early October, he would appear before the Petersburg Committee to support Lenin's plea for organization of an immediate armed uprising against advocates of more cautious tactics. And to the 36 local party officials assembled on the night of August 27th, he proposed a significantly more independent, militant course than that being pursued by party leaders at Smolny. Obviously familiar with Lenin's rumors of a conspiracy, he warned the Petersburg Committee against repeating the mistakes of some Moscow Bolsheviks during the Moscow State Conference and collaborating with the Mensheviks and SRs. In Moscow, he observed, first the government turned to us for help, and then we were spat on. Totally rejecting Bolshevik participation in mutual defense organs of any kind, he insisted that there must be no interaction with the Soviet majority. Instead, he urged that the Bolsheviks work to control the actions of the masses themselves, while pursuing their own interests and helping neither Kerensky nor Kornilov. When Bubnov had finished, Kalinin challenged the idea that the party had little stake in the outcome of the conflict between the government and the general staff, contending that if Kornilov appeared on the verge of defeating Kerensky, the Bolsheviks would have to intervene on Kerensky's side. Disagreeing with Kalinin's moderate stance, a succession of speakers vented their hostility to the moderate socialists and the government, government, as well as to Kornilov. In their frustration, these speakers also lashed out at higher party authorities, at Bolshevik moderates in the executive committees for an excess of defensism, at the leadership of the military organization for elusiveness, and at the Central Committee for operating in a fog during the July crisis. The Central Committee, as well as the Executive Commission of the Petersburg Committee, were chided for cooling the masses too long, for acting arbitrarily and independently, and for a Philistine outlook. On the other hand, somewhat contradictorily, the two party committees came in for criticism for not exerting enough leadership, particularly for devoting insufficient attention to keeping lower party bodies and the masses abreast of changes in the political situation. Observed that the, observed the Vyberg district's always irreverent Latsis, recently the Bolshevik central organs have made one apprehensive about the future of the party. Midway in the meeting, senti midway in the meeting sentiment against the executive commission was so strong that it appeared the entire commission might be ousted on the spot. Ultimately, it was agreed that new elections for the commission would be held at the next meeting. Although a few Petersburg committee members must have been wondering privately whether it was not high time to organize a mass armed uprising, it is apparent that to the bulk of the committee, discussions along this line were, as Kalinin said, nonsense. 
At one caustic moment in the debate, an unidentified district committee representative abruptly shifted attention to practical matters. We have Vermicelli here, he shouted. Consideration of the current moment is mixed up with pot shots at the executive commission. Let's get down to concrete defense measures. Despite these recriminations, there was little doubt within the Petersburg Committee about the necessity of drawing upon the full resources of the party and rallying mass organizations, as well as workers, soldiers, and sailors generally, for a life and death struggle against Kornilov. Committee members now turned their attention to preparations for battle. It was belatedly acknowledged, even by Bubnov, that for, pur for purposes of information, the party would have to maintain contact with the defense organ established by the leadership of the Soviet. An emergency communications network was established, with representatives from each district to be stationed at Petersburg Committee Headquarters, and round-the-clock watches to be maintained at the headquarters of district and factory shop committees. The Executive Commission was made responsible for for preparing leaflets, calling workers and soldiers to arms, and for contingency military planning. It was decided that all party agitators would be mobilized for action <coughs> in working class districts the next day. Most important individual Bolsheviks were designated to coordinate defense preparations with those of major mass organizations in the capital. In short, Though fully conscious of the differences between their own goals and those of Kerensky, and also wary of close collaboration with the moderate socialists, members of the Petersburg Committee joined their efforts with those of other left groups and directed their organizational talents and vast resources and energy to the fight against Kornilov. There are some signs that during the Kornilov emergency, the impulse for an immediate rising against the provisional government, as well as against Kornilov, may have been stronger within the Bolshevik military organization than within the Petersburg Committee. The relative militancy of at least a segment of the military organization is reflected in a one-page extra edition of Soldat, which appeared on August 29th and in several editorials in the regular August 29th edition. The lead editorial in the August 29th extra edition portrayed the situation in the following terms. The conspiracy is revealed. The terrible thing is not so much the two savage divisions located in or located at Dano, but the powerful military machine which is in Kornilov's hands and which he can employ against the revolution by means of crude provocations. We witnessed how this can be done in Petrograd. Why did Kornilov need malicious rumors about disturbances allegedly being prepared by the Bolsheviks on the half year anniversary of the revolution? This was Kornilov's work. If the provocation had been successful, if shots had again been heard on Petrograd streets, neither Kerensky nor the Soviet leaders would have hesitated for a moment appealing to Kornilov for help, and he would have appeared here at the head of his Chetniks and in Ingushes as an angel of mercy. The power of the counter-revolution is simply enormous, and very nearly its most important source of strength lies in the readiness of the government to yield to Kornilov rather than permit the full development of the revolution. Only the full development of the revolution, only a consistently revolutionary government, will not make a deal with Kornilov or the cadets or the Germans. The full development of the revolution means transfer of all power into the hands of the revolutionary workers and poorer peasantry, and the waging of an uncompromising struggle against all enemies of the people. Exactly as is the case here now, when the enemy stood at the walls of Paris in 1871, the bourgeoisie preferred to deal with the enemy rather than compromise with the workers. The workers overthrew the bourgeoisie, took power into their own hands, and yielded only because they were ousted by the overwhelming force of government troops. They were defeated because they were isolated. Now the situation is different. 
the workers' revolution, the government of the revolutionary people, the dictatorship of the working class and poorer peasantry will not disappear without a trace in a country in the sixth month in the sixth month of revolution. Revolutionary Petrograd, as revolutionary Paris never did, will carry with it the entire country, and there is no other way out. As nearly as one can tell, military organization mil military organization militancy during the Kornilov crisis did not go beyond such journalistic endeavor. On the night of August 28th, military organization leaders met with the representatives in most units of the garrison. Sverdlov, who had been appointed by the Central Committee to oversee military organization operations after the July uprising, chaired the meeting. In the resolution adopted by the assembled soldier Bolsheviks, compromisers in the Soviet were blamed for facilitating the consolidation of the counter-revolution. The resolution called the resolution called for the formation of a people's government, but by implication, compromisers could be included in this government. As a sign that the moderate socialist majority in the Soviet was genuinely ready to break with the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie, the resolution demanded, among other things, the liberation of Bolsheviks jailed following the July uprising, the arrest of counter-revolutionary officers, the the preparation of the Petrograd garrison for battle, and with participation by representatives of soldier organizations, the formulation of plans for defeating and suppressing counter-revolutionary forces. The resolution also advocated the arming of the workers and the abolition of capital punishment at the front. After their meeting, the military organization representatives returned to their respective units and did not reassemble until the crisis was over. The relevant sources furnish very little evidence of further activity on the part of the military organization or its bureau as independent organizations in the struggle against Kornilov. This does not mean, however, that members of the military organization were not of key importance at this time. Rather, what appears to have happened is that in the sudden emergency occasioned by the advance of Kornilov's forces, military organization leaders like their counterparts in the Petersburg Committee, channeled much of their effort to help defend the revolution through specially created organs such as the Committee for Struggle, other non-party mass organizations, and the Soviets. Working within these institutions, Bolshevik military organization members played a prominent role in helping to mobilize and arm large numbers of workers, soldiers, and sailors and giving programmatic and tactical direction to their efforts. The party's official stance in the crisis was summed up in a policy directive, which the Central Committee cabled to 20 key provincial Bolshevik committees on August 29th. In the interest of repulsing the counter-revolution, we are working in collaboration with the Soviet on a technical and informational basis, while fully retaining our independent political position. Ad hoc revolutionary committees similar to the Committee for Struggle had been created all over Russia during the February Revolution. On a more limited scale, such institutions had reappeared at the time of the June and July crises and during the counter-revolutionary scare of mid-August. The vast majority of these committees remained in existence for only a short time, which distinguished them in part from the more permanent Soviets. Uniting representatives of all left groups, such ad hoc committees filled the need for authoritative military revolutionary organizations capable of acting expe expeditiously in emergencies. In response to the Kornilov crisis, revolutionary committees sprang up like mushrooms after a late summer rain. Between August 27th and 30th, more than 240 of them were formed in various parts of Russia, often by urban and rural Soviets. In the Petrograd area alone, in addition to the Committee for Struggle, established by the All-Russian Executive Committees on the night of August 27th to 28th, ad hoc committees to mobilize and organize the masses, procure weapons and ammunition, assure the maintenance of essential services, and, in general, to direct and coordinate the defense of the revolution, were hastily created by the Petrograd Soviet. The Inter-District Conference, several district work 
are several districts district fuck several district soviets and naval soviets in Rival, housing fours and kronstadt in part because of the isolation and lack of authority of the provisional government within those sectors of the russian population most hostile to kornilov and no doubt also because many high government officials were secretly sympathetic to kornilov and hence at best passive in the campaign against him the committee for struggle the committee for struggle above all its military section willy nilly became the na the national command post for combating the right as formed on august 28th the committee was composed of three representatives each of the bolsheviks mensheviks and srs five representatives each from the all russian executive committees and two representatives each from the central trade union and petrograd soviets a representative of the interdistrict conference was added to the committee the next day in addition to its military section the committee for struggle had a political com commissariat and an information section the committee issued a constant stream of emergency bulletins which through the petrograd telegraph agency gave wide publicity to appeals and directives from the government soviets and other mass organizations and kept citizens everywhere abreast of late political and military developments the committee also facilitated the distribution of arms and ammunition to garrison units in need of reinforcement initiated steps to protect food supplies dispatched a number of influential soviet officials to meet and harangue enemy forces and in the meantime working through rail and communications workers unions sought to disrupt kornilov's advance toward the capital nonetheless the decisive moments of the kornilov emergency occurred so quickly that effective coordination of the campaign against the right even in the petrograd area proved impossible it was also unnecessary or it was also unnecessary spurred by the news of kornilov's attack all political organizations to the left of the cadets every labor organization of any import and soldier and sailor committees at all levels immediately rose to fight against kornilov it would be difficult to find in recent history a more powerful effective display of largely spontaneous and unified mass political action the initiative energy and authority of the petrograd interdistrict conference of soviets during the kornilov days emerge with particular clarity from the relevant documents as early as august 24th the conference still directed by the menshevik internationalist alexander gorin but strongly influenced by the bolsheviks fearful that an attack by the counter-revolution was imminent had passed a resolution which demanded that the government immediately declare russia a democratic republic and announced that russian war aims presumably as defined by the petrograd soviet in march were immutable the resolution insisted on the immediate breakup of counter-revolutionary headquarters and formal recognition of the authority of democratic committees within the army demanded an end to the persecution of leftists and called for the immediate formation of a committee of public safety and fighting squads of workers and unemployed to defend the revolution Consequently, the interdistrict conference was fully primed to take prompt action when, a few days later, Kornilov's intentions were disclosed. At an emergency session of the conference on August 28th, the assembled district Soviet representatives voted to delegate a representative to the Committee for Struggle and to each of its sections to remain in permanent session to take the lead in organizing an armed workers militia under the political responsibility of the interdistrict conference and district soviets to impose control by district soviets over the actions of local government commissars to send out roving patrols charged with detaining counter-revolutionary agitators and to establish close contact between soviets and dumas in all districts these were not mere statements of intent. The inter-district conference at once dispatched to all district Soviets in and around Petrograd specific, direct, or specific directives relating to the recruitment, organization, and arm, arming of a workers' militia. For the duration of the Kornilov emergency, 
the inter-district conferences offices at Smolny and the headquarters of each district Soviet became directing centers for the preservation of revolutionary order and for mass action against the counter-revolution. The activities, the activities of the Pirov District Soviet are illustrative of the initiatives taken by other district Soviets. On August 28th, Mikhail Bogdanov, a Bolshevik construction worker who represented the Pirov Soviet in the interdistrict or interdistrict conference, reported to a Soviet erroneously as it turned out that loyalist forces in Luga were suffering reverses. Bogdanov also informed the Pirov deputies of the interdistrict conference's plans for the organization of workers' militia. Bogdanov's listeners responded to this news by quickly agreeing to arrange factory meetings where measures for coping with the existing emergency would be discussed and to form a central revolutionary committee to organize and direct a Red Guard. The following morning, a proclamation from the Peterov Central Revolutionary Committee, the Peterov District Soviet, and factory shop committees in the Peterov District was posted throughout the district. It announced that military conspirators headed by the traitor General Kornilov and supported by the blindness and lack of political consciousness of some divisions are moving toward the heart of the revolution. Petrograd, or Petrograd, Counter-revolutionary supporters, this proclamation continued, are attempting to stab in the back revolutionary forces defending Petrograd, circulating prov provocatory rumors and appeals aimed at stimulating panic among the populace and bringing workers into the streets prematurely. Don't be taken in by such provocations, the proclamation warned. Don't permit drunkenness, rely on your own power to maintain revolutionary order. Don't undertake mass action in the absence of our call. Let us concentrate all our power on the fight against the counter-revolution. Maintain calm, restraint, and discipline. At the direction of the Peterov Central Revolutionary Committee, large numbers of factory workers were armed and sent to, to dig trenches, erect barricades, and string barbed wire along the southern approaches to the city. Simultaneously, other workers were made responsible for keeping tabs on the activities of potential rightist supporters, protecting factories and helping to preserve order. <laughs> other organizations, among them the Petrograd City Duma, the Petrograd Trade Union Soviet, the Central Soviet of Factory Shop Committees, and individual trade unions and factory committees were similarly active in the struggle against Kornilov. On August 28th, an emergency session of the City Duma, in which the Bolsheviks were now the second largest party, voted to prepare appropriate appeals to Kornilov's troops and to the population of Petrograd. The deputies also formed a commission to work with the authorities in assuring the procurement and distribution of adequate food supplies and selected a team of deputies to go to Luga to win over Kornilov's troops. On August 26th, the Petrograd Trade Union Soviet and the Central Soviet of Factory Shop Committees, meeting jointly, had endorsed the Inter-District Conference's call for a Committee of Public Safety to help organize the defense of the capital. Now, at an unscheduled session on August 28th, the Petrograd Trade Union Soviet's Executive Commission, in which Bolshevik influence was strong, responded to an invitation to appoint a representative to the Committee for Struggle by choosing the Bolshevik Vasily Schmidt for the post. The next morning, after hearing an alarming report on food supply stocks in the capital from the head of the Food Supply Administration, the full trade union Soviet formed a food supply commission of its own composed of representatives from the Transport Workers Union the Flour Mill Workers' Union, the Restaurant, Food Store, and Food Industry Workers, and the Trade Union Soviet. On August 29th, the Central Soviet of Factory Shop Committees met with Factory Shop Committee representatives from industrial plants throughout the capital to evaluate preparations for battle and to help coordinate the distribution of arms to workers. 
That evening, the Trade Union Soviet and the Central Soviet of Factory Shop Committees held a joint session. After hearing a progress report by Schmidt on the work of the Committee for Struggle, the participants in this meeting agreed to support it in every way possible and to coordinate their own defense efforts with those of the committee. They also voted to insist on the liberation of revolutionaries still in jail and on the adoption of decisive measures to suppress the rightist press and arrest counter-revolutionaries. Moreover, after re-evaluating the question of distributing arms to workers, they enthusiastically endorsed such action. The Petrograd Union of Metal Workers, which as spokesman for over 200,000 workers was far and away the most powerful labor union in Russia, allocated 50,000 rubles from its treasury, as well as the services of its large experienced staff to the Committee for Struggle. The left SR controlled chauffeurs union announced that the government could count on all of the transport and maintenance services it could provide. While the printers union dominated by Mensheviks ordered typesetters to boycott presses that published newspapers supporting Kornilov. <clears throat> of the individual trade unions, the most important during the Kornilov crisis was inevitably the Union of Railway Workers. On August 28th and 29th, the Soviet Central Executive Committee had warned rail personnel that it was their responsibility to prevent needless bloodshed. Rail workers were directed to monitor the progress of military forces being moved toward Petrograd, to obey without hesitation orders of the government and Soviet in regard to the holding up and redirection of these troops, and to ignore instructions coming from Kornilov. An analogous telegram was dispatched at about the same time by Kerensky to supervisors on all rail lines, in the rear and at the front and to all rail committees. Significantly earlier, on August 27th, the All-Russian Executive Committee at Railway Workers, or of Railway Workers, customarily designated by its Russian acronym VIGSL, had formed a special bureau for struggle against Kornilov's forces. On August 29th, Vigzel sent telegrams to key points along the entire Russian rail network, directing that suspicious telegrams be held up and that Vigzel be kept informed of the size and destination of all suspect military forces traveling on rail, line, fuck, rail lines. Rail personnel were authorized to interrupt the movement of counter-revolutionary forces by any and all means, including withholding rail cars, absenting themselves from their posts, and, if need be, dismantling tracks and blocking the right-of-way. They were also encouraged to halt shipment of provisions to areas occupied by Kornilov's supporters. Implementation of these directives began immediately. Within hours after public announcement of the Kornilov emergency, alarm whistles were sounded in factories throughout Petrograd. Acting on their own without instructions from higher authorities, workers reinforced security around plant buildings and grounds and began to form fighting detachments. On August 28th to 29th, long lines of workers could be seen in the factory districts waiting to enroll in these detachments, referred to with increasing frequency as Red Guards. To help arm these recruits, personnel in the cannon shops at the Putilov factory speeded production of a variety of weapons which were dispatched directly to the field without even a test firing. Metal workers simply accompanied their products and adjusted the weapons on the spot. The factory committee at the sprawling Sestroretsk weapons factory funneled a few thousand rifles and limited quantities of ammunition to the newly formed workers' red guards. Other weapons were obtained from the arsenal in the Peter and Paul fortress and from garrison soldiers, but the demand for arms far outran the supply. During the Kornilov days, many of the newly recruited red guards received training in the handling of arms from soldiers assigned to this task by the Bolshevik military organization. 
After a hasty indoctrination, Red Guards were dispatched, some to man hurriedly constructed defense fortifications in the southern Narva and Moscow districts, and on the Pol Pol Polkova Heights, others to lay barbed wire, dig trenches, or help tear up track along the rail lines leading to the capital, and still others to meet General Krimov's advancing troops. Most soldiers in the partially dismantled Petrograd garrison responded to the crisis with equal dispatch. Soon after news of Kornilov's ultimatum to the government began to circulate on August 27th, unit committees and hastily organized mass meetings of soldiers in military barracks throughout the capital and its suburbs had passed resolutions condemning the counter-revolution and voicing their readiness to help defend the revolution. Garrison soldiers strengthened communications with neighboring military units and with such institutions as the Committee for Struggle, the soldiers' section of the Petrograd Soviet, District Soviets, and the Bolshevik military organization. Garrison units suspended leaves, increased the number of soldiers assigned to guard duty, took stock of existing supplies of arms and ammunition, and formed delegations of agitators in composite fighting detachments for service at the front. The Litovsky Guards Regiment declared in a resolution of August 28th, all troops not involved in work details or without valid medical excuses are required to participate in the detachment now being formed. Officers and men refusing to do their duty will be subject to revolutionary trial. The 6th Engineers quickly organized a 600-man detachment to aid in the construction of defense fortifications. The Petrograd Carters Battalion pledged the 500 carts at its disposal to help supply military units defending the Soviet. Between the night of August 28th and the following evening, detachments of armed soldiers from all the guards and reserve infantry regiments and numerous artillery and technical units in the capital, often accompanied by their officers, moved out to Gatchina, Sartsko Selo, Krasno Selo, and other strategic points, established themselves in trenches, some of which had been dug hours earlier by factory workers, and nervously awaited the enemy. Within the Petrograd garrison, only Cossack troops and military school cadets did not join at once in the campaign against the counter-revolution. The former remained neutral, while the latter sided openly with Kornilov. Baltic fleet installations dealt with the emergency in such the same way, or in much the same way. On August 28th, the Soviet, the Soviet in Reval, meeting with the executive committee of the Estonian Soviet and with army and fleet committees and representatives of the major socialist parties, organized a united executive committee to direct the fight against the counter-revolution. Among other things, this organization brought garrison and naval units and the Reval area to battle readiness and instructed revolutionary forces to occupy key rail points nearby. In Helsingfors, on the same day, a joint emergency meeting of the Regional Executive Committee of the Army, Fleet and Workers in Finland, the Executive Committee of the Helsingfors Soviet, members of Centrobalt, the Regional Committee of Finnish Peasant Soviets, and representatives of local army and ship committees, Altogether, some 600 leftist political leaders, soldiers, sealers, and workers began with the passage of a resolution branding Kornilov and his supporters traitors to the revolution and the state and demanding the transfer of governmental power to the revolutionary democracy and the immediate shutdown of all bourgeois newspapers and presses. The meeting culminated in the creation of a revolutionary committee with unrestricted powers to prevent counter-revolutionary action and to maintain order in Finland. Launching operations promptly, this committee helped to paralyze the activities of several large Finnish-based Cossack and cavalry units 
which Kornilov had counted upon for support, and dispatched a composite 1,500-man combat force from Vyberg to Petrograd. Comrades, a terrible hour has struck, th has struck. The revolution and all its achievements are in the gravest danger, began the Helsingfors Revolutionary Committee's proclamation of its supreme political authority in Finland. The time has come when the revolution and the country need your strength, your sacrifices, perhaps your lives. Because of this, the Revolutionary Committee appeals to all of you to come to the defense of the revolution and freedom with closed ranks, to deal a crushing blow to the counter-revolution, nipping it in the bud. Initially, word of the Kornilov crisis was brought to Kronstadt during the night of August 27th by some sailors from the cruiser Aurora, then undergoing capital repairs in Petrograd. The executive committee of the Kronstadt Soviet, under its newly elected chairman, Lazar Bregman, a Bolshevik, immediately took control of all communications facilities, weapons stores, and private and port vessels. Dispatched commissars to military headquarters in nearby naval forts at Eno and Krasnaya Gorka, and created a military technical committee. This committee, which included the overall commander of all the Kronstadt naval units, the Kronstadt Fort Commander, the head of the Kronstadt Militia, and representatives of all major parties in the Executive Committee, assumed for practical purposes full command authority over all military elements in Kronstadt. After receiving an urgent request for troop support from the Committee for Struggle, the Military Technical Committee shot back a demand for the release of our comrades, the finest fighters and sons of the Revolution who are at this minute languishing in prison. At the same time, it declared unequivocally that the entire Kronstadt garrison, as one man, was ready to come to the defense of the Revolution. 3,000 well-armed sailors, a high percentage of whom had been to Petrograd last as participants in the July uprising, departed for the capital in the early morning of August 29th. After disembarking at the quays along Vasilevsky Island, they were dispatched to help protect rail stations, bridges, the main post office, the, the main post office, post office, the telegraph, my mouth is not working right today, the telegraph and telephone station, the Winter Palace, and other key government buildings. The overwhelming superiority of the left over the pro-Kornilov forces was quickly evident. Steps taken by the moderate socialists and Bolsheviks to ensure that factory workers would not be deceived by rightist agitators achieved their aim. Petrograd newspapers during the Kornilov days contained reports of scattered rightist agitation among the masses, but in no case did these incidents lead to the large-scale civil disorders hoped for by the conspirators. After the crisis erupted on August 27th, conducting open counter-revolutionary agitation anywhere in Petrograd became very hazardous. In addition, swift action by rail and telegraph workers and fuck in addition swift action by rail and telegraph workers initially prevented rightist leaders in the capital from establishing communications with advancing counter-revolutionary forces within units of the petrograd garrison the relatively few officers with the temerity to register sympathy for kornilov or even reluctance to oppose him were simply ignored to be dealt with when time permitted in the Helsingfors area, some officers suspected of harboring counter-revolutionary sentiments were lynched. In Vyberg, several high-level officers who refused to acknowledge the authority of a commissar sent to their unit by the Hel Helsingfors Revolutionary Committee were immediately arrested. A mob of soldiers later broke into their place of detention and killed them. Aboard the battleship Petro Pavlovsk, based in Helsingfors. The entire crew participated in a vote to decide whether or not to execute four young officers who declined to pledge their allegiance to democratic organizations. Sentiment was overwhelmingly against the officers and they were slaughtered, the firing squad carrying out the sentence having been selected by lot. On August 29th, 14 officers allegedly connected with the Kornilov conspiracy were rounded up in the Hotel Astoria 
in the center of Petrograd. That day as well, a number of the junior officers who had been temporarily transferred from the front to Petrograd, supposedly for training in the handling of newly developed English trench mortars, <clears throat> were discovered and detained aboard trains bound for the capital. It appears that most rightist leaders in Petrograd, among them Colonel V.I. Sidorin, chief liaison officer between Stavka and conspiratorial groups in the capital, Colonel Decimeter, head of the Republican Center's military section, and P.N. Finisov, a vice president of the Republican Center, spent much of their time on August 27th and 28th simply waiting for word of Krimov's whereabouts. They passed the intervening hours downing quantities of vodka in private rooms at two popular Petrograd night spots, the Mali Yars Yaroslavets and Villa Road. On the evening of the 28th, Decimeter and Finisov set off toward Luga to locate Krimov. Sidorin remained behind to supervise the concoction of a Bolshevik riot upon receipt of a coded message from Decimeter, act at once according to instructions. Such a signal was dispatched to Sidorin on the morning of August 29th and, received, and was received in Petrograd that evening. But by that time, the futility of the rightist cause was obvious. <clears throat> Sidorin reportedly was pressured out of proceeding with a simulated rising by General Alexeev, who threatened suicide unless the conspirators' plans were aborted. In the end, Sidorin simply disappeared, allegedly taking with him a considerable sum of money put up by Putilov and the Society for the Economic Rehabilitation of Russia to finance a military coup. As for the forces under General Krimov's command, it will be recalled that on August 27th, Kornilov directed elements of the Third Corps to continue their advance toward Petrograd and to occupy the city. <clears throat> the next day, troop trains carrying these forces were strung out for hundreds of miles along the major rail lines leading to the capital. The Savage Division on the Moskovsko Vindavo Rubinskoy line between Dano and Viritsa, the Usuriski Usur Mounted Division on the Baltic line between Revel and Narva, and Narva and Nyamberg, and the First Don Cossack Division on the Warsaw line between Peskov and Luka. Units of the Savage Division pose the most immediate threat to the capital. On the evening of August 28th, elements of the Ingushki and Cherkesky regiments reached Viritsa, only 37 miles from the capital, but rail workers there had blocked the right of way with lumber filled railway cars and had torn up the track for miles beyond. Not only were the troops unable to progress further by rail, it was impossible for them to communicate effectively with other elements of the division of this General Krimov. Stavka or Petrograd. While the division's officers fumed helplessly, the soldiers were harangued by a stream of agitators, among whom were emissaries from the Committee for Struggle, several Petrograd district Soviets and a number of Petrograd factories, as well as from garrison military units then digging in for battle outside Tsarsko Selo further north. Also on hand were a team of nearly 100 agitators selected by Centro Flot, the Central Executive Committee of the Navy, from among sailors in the 2nd Baltic Fleet crew who previously had been attached to the Savage Division as machine gunners, and a smaller Al Muslim delegation, or sorry, all Muslim, fuck, all Muslim delegation dispatched by the Executive Committee of the Union of Muslim Soviets, which included a grandson of the legendary Shamil. At times, echelons of the Savage Division were encircled by local workers and peasants who berated them for betraying the revolution. 
the troops had not been told the real reason for their movement northward, and, as it turned out, most had little sympathy for Kornilov's objectives, and no desire to oppose the provisional government in the Soviet. On August 30th, the troops hoisted a red flag inscribed Land and Freedom over their headquarters and arrested the headquarters commandant when he protested. They then formed a revolutionary committee to prevent any further movement toward Petrograd to inform other units in the division about how they were being used by the counter-revolution and to organize a meeting of representatives of all units in the division. When such a meeting attended by the Muslim delegation was convened the next day, it voted to send a delegation to Petrograd at once with a pledge of loyalty to the provisional government. The Ustarisky Mounted Division found, it, found itself in a similar situation. On August 28th, railway workers in Narva delayed its forward progress for some seven hours. Late that night, lead elements of the, of the division reached Yamburg but could go no further since the track beyond had been blocked and wrecked. On August 29th and 30th, crowds of agitators from the Narva and Yamburg Soviets and from factories, military units and mass organizations in Petrograd, as well as a delegation from the Committee for Struggle led by Tsuritelli, circulated among the troops. As in the case of the Savage Division, the Ussuriski soldiers were quickly persuaded not to obey their officers' orders and to pledge loyalty to the provisional government. All that was necessary to win over some unit committees was a reading of Kerensky's initial public proclamations of Kornilov's treachery. Probably the most difficult force to neutralize was the 1st Don Cossack Division, with which General Krimov and his staff were traveling. Elements of the division had reached Luga the night of August 27th, but here too, speedy measures by railway workers acting in concert with the Luga, Soviet, stimmied further advance by rail. The railway workers held back rolling stock, wrecked bridges and track, and effectively blocked communications between Krimov's forces. Subsequently, the trains carrying the 1st Don Cossack Division were surrounded by soldiers from the 20,000-man Luga garrison. Deputies from the Luga Soviet and the Petrograd City Duma, as well as worker-soldier representatives from the capital, swarmed around the wagons, haranguing the occupants through the train windows. Officers in the division protested the presence of Bolshevik agents, but to no avail. Krimov, upon receiving orders from Kornilov to continue his advance on Petrograd regardless of the obstacles, weighed the possibility of marching his troops the remaining 57 miles to the capital. He rejected this course when it became clear that the soldiers from the Luga garrison would resist such action by force and that the Cossacks would not oppose the soldiers. Actually, there were almost no skirmishes between Kornilov's forces and those on the government's side during the entire affair. In the case of the 1st Don Cossack Division, agitators were soon drawing the troops to mass rallies before Krimov's very eyes. With relatively little difficulty, they won soldier representatives in most units to their point of view, and by August 30th, some Cossacks were expressing their readiness to arrest Krimov. Finally, late on the afternoon of August 30th, a government emissary, Colonel Georgi Samarin, invited Krimov to accompany him back to Petrograd for talks with Kerensky. Given firm assurances of his personal safety, Krimov reluctantly acquiesced. Krimov, who had just received word from fin Finisov and Decimeter <clears throat> that disorders would break out in the capital momentarily, seems to have left Luga with some hope that Kerensky might still turn to him for help in suppressing the left. His hope, however, was short-lived. Arriving in Petrograd by car the night of August 30th to 31st, Krimov found the city altogether quiet. It was plain by now that the affair was all but over. The bulk of the army had remained loyal to the government in the Soviet. On the southwestern front, the outspoken General Denikin had been incarcerated by his own troops. The aging commander of the northern front, General Klim Klimbovsky, who had disobeyed Kerensky's order to take Kornilov's place as supreme commander, 
quietly resigned and was soon replaced by the leftish General Cheremisov. Commanders of the other major Russian fronts now belatedly pledged their loyalty to the government. Kerensky named himself Supreme Commander, and the conservative General Alexeev emerged from retirement to become Chief of Staff. Because of his former close association with Kornilov, Savinkov was stripped of his posts as Governor General and Acting War Minister. His replacement in the latter capacity was General Verkovsky, the commander of the Moscow Military District. A high-level commission appointed by Kerensky, much like the body created several, created several weeks earlier to hand up indictments in connection with the July uprising, was about to begin an, begin an investigation of the conspiracy. The public figures who had hailed the People's Commander-in-Chief at the time of the Moscow Conference now hastened to put distance between themselves and Kornilov declared Rodzienko sanctimoniously, all I know about the evils of the day is what I read in the papers. To start internecine, internecine warfare and argument now is a crime against the motherland. Vladimir Lvov, still seemingly in a daze, expressed genuine pleasure at the outcome of the affair. On August 30th, from his jail cell, he penned the following note to Krensky. My dear Alexander Fedorovich, from the bottom of my heart, I congratulate you and am happy that I delivered a friend from Kornilov's clutches. Yours always and everywhere, V. Lvov. General Krimov met with Kerensky in the Winter Palace on the morning of August 31st. According to all reports, their conversation was extremely heated, although information on precisely what trans transpired is contradictory. Krimov evidently insisted that his troops had not been directed against the provisional government, that his only object was and had always been to help facilitate the maintenance of order. Hearing this after he had read Krimov's August 26th order regarding the imposition of military rule in Petrograd, Krensky grew livid and berated Krimov fiercely for his duplicity. For Krimov, the experience was understandably trying. A courageous commander who took great pride in the traditional military virtues of patriotism, straightforwardness, and decisiveness, he had hoped since February to help halt the revolution and re-establish a strong central government in the belief that otherwise Russia was doomed. Yet now he was forced to lie to save himself and his associates, accused of crimes against the state by a man who, for some time, had been privately voicing similar convictions. Ahead lay further interrogation, the necessity for more deception, and the ignominid, ignominity, <laughs> fuck, Ign ignominity of arrest, prosecution, and prison. Krimov, in despair, left Krensky at around 2 p.m. with the understanding that he would appear at the Admiralty for further questioning later in the afternoon. From the Winter Palace, he went to the apartment of a friend, where, to no one in particular, he observed dejectedly. The last card for saving the motherland has been beaten. Life is no longer worth living. Then, retiring to a private room, ostensibly for a rest, he scribbled a brief message to Kornilov and shot himself once through the heart.